I think what you uh, have heard from the President of the State of the Union and what you've heard, frankly, uh, throughout uh, this presidency is a commitment uh, to build a clean energy economy in this, uh, in this country. That's going to require a lot of steps. Uh, a lot of which we've already making a lot, made progress on so far. It's going to require new investments uh, in the clean technologies that really have a chance to uh, to, to, to lead the way uh, in this clean energy economy. Uh, investments in things like wind and solar, uh, advanced batteries uh, that will help uh, that will help uh, uh, in the next generation of cars. It's also going to require taking steps to create new incentives so that energy efficiency and clean energy are profitable. And that's really what the, uh, what the comprehensive climate change legislation that's currently working its way through Congress is about. Uh, the House has passed uh, a, a comprehensive climate bill, and the President remains committed to working toward uh, uh, getting, getting a similar bill uh, through the Senate as well. It's not going to be easy, uh, but we remain committed to uh, that goal. And we do hear a lot about the questions of, can we afford uh, that kind of change? Can we afford that kind of um, uh, 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 change in our economy right now? But I think that the President's perspective is that the country that ends up leading in the clean energy revolution is going to be the country whose economy ends up leading in the 21st century. He wants America to be that economy. He thinks comprehensive climate legislation is an integral part of that. And so we're going to keep working towards that goal. Great. So I uh, apologize for the technical uh, error there. Let's see if we can get it right the second time. And, and Ben, we actually have a question for you now. Um, our next video question. So we'll cue it up here uh, while they're playing it on the screen. It's playing now, so let's let it finish here, and then you can answer. President. It's written out here. Airplane if you want. crashes in then, Iran that are said to have been caused by oil planes due to sanctions on new purchases. If there are any plans to normalize trade relations and lift sanctions that are in some ways punishing the people of Iran and emboldening the government. Um, well, thanks for the question. Um, of course, uh, the United States. Um, continues to have uh, certain sanctions on Iran along with the rest of the international community. Um, I think what we've done though over the course of the year uh, is make it very clear to the Iranian government um, that we are offering them uh, a different path in which those sanctions will be lifted and they'll be able to have political and economic integration with the uh, international community that will benefit the Iranian people. Um, the reason that sanctions are in place uh, on Iran is because they have failed to live up to their international obligations, particularly with regards to their illicit nuclear program. Um, Iran continually has uh, been found in violation of, of, of various obligations that they have, for instance, to the International Atomic Energy Agency. For instance, just this last year, uh, it was revealed that they've been building a, a secret nuclear facility in Gom. Uh, that was in, in violation of their international obligations. So uh, these sanctions are in place because Iran has refused to live up to their obligations. It has nothing to do with the international community's desire to punish uh, uh, Iran in particular. Uh, and what we've said is, uh, if, you can, if, you, if you shift course and change your behavior, uh, we will have deeper economic and political integration uh, with, the, with the Iranian government. Uh, unfortunately, to date, uh, the Iranian government has not taken that opportunity. For instance, a very fair uh, deal was offered uh, in which we would help Iran develop medical isotopes for a research reactor in Tehran if they agreed to ship their low enriched uranium to a third country. Um, they still haven't taken that, that uh, offer, which remains on the table. And what we said is if Iran continues to violate its international obligations and develop an, uh, an illicit nuclear program that could be used for a nuclear weapon, we will have to move to increase sanctions. Uh, however, I just want to underscore, though, that the onus is really on the Iranian government because they have the choice. Um, if they live up to the responsibilities that any other country and any other government has to live up to. So again, it's not singling them out, it's holding them the exact same standard that other countries are held to. Those sanctions won't be imposed and Iran can have th that better relationship with the international community. Uh, I'd also add though, 
that just as we're concerned about Iran's uh, nuclear program, uh, we're also deeply concerned about the way in which the Iranian government has treated its people. Uh, for, for some time now, of course, there have been human rights concerns in Iran. Uh, those have escalated since the uh, June elections, in which we've seen uh, Iranians who have attempted to exercise their universal rights um, been, be uh, suppressed, uh, in some cases in, imprisoned, uh, and, and in some cases intimidated uh, by the Iranian government. So we're also joining with the international community and calling on Iran and the Iranian government to rep, uh, respect the universal rights of their people. Uh, and this is, of course, an uh, issue of deep concern to us because uh, we don't want to see uh, any more uh, violence uh, in Iran, uh, any more, uh, any more uh, essentially uh, violations of human rights take place uh, on the streets of Iran. Um, so in both the nuclear issue and in the human rights area, we continue to call on the Iranian government to live up to its own international obligations. And if they do, if they do so, uh, they will have that deeper economic relationship that will benefit the aspirations of the Iranian people. If they don't, uh, the onus will be on them for the consequences uh, that follow. Great. So just a reminder, um, if you want to join the live discussion that's happening right now, there's actually two places uh, where you can join. The first is whitehouse.gov slash live. There's a chat room where people are uh, tossing out questions. Uh, and this is also a follow-up event to the uh, question and answer session the president held with YouTube, uh, political director Steve Grove earlier this week, and they have a live chat there at youtube.com slash citizen tube. I encourage you to, to go to one of those places and, and join the discussion. We actually have a question now uh, that came in through YouTube for Heather um, from ex nonviolent felon uh, in Virginia who asks, why is it left up to the individual states to restore voting rights for nonviolent felons? Several states, including Virginia, have historically denied restoration of rights even after the person has paid their debt to society for their mistake. It's a great question. Uh, by and large, uh, a lot of um, most standards for voting are set at the state level. However, there are a series of federal uh, requirements and standards, and um, the, the particular one that you've identified, which is whether or not felons, uh, felons can vote after having served their sentences, one that, there ha that many legislators, and President Obama is among them, uh, was in the Senate and is now as president, believes that we should, um, we should address at the federal level. Several states have laws that say once you've served your time, uh, you're done uh, with your prison sentence with probation, you should be able to uh, have your voting rights restored. And what we need to do is find more ways to encourage people to participate in the political process. Uh, we've talked about ways of doing that across the board. This is an area we, we want more people to vote. We want to make it easier to vote. And the president's position and many other uh, legislators' position is that for felons, once you've served your sentence and you've done your time and, and you've completed that, you should have your vi voting rights restored. So historically, a lot of these um, regulations and laws were governed at the state level, but increasingly the, there's been movement uh, and support to some, some basic federal standards, and this is among them in the discussion. So hopefully as, as we move forward um, with Congress on, on issues of access to um, same-day election and things of that nature, this is one of the federal standards that can be addressed. Great. Um, we had another question come in, Ben, while you were uh, answering about um, Iran um, concerning Afghanistan. Um, came in from Bob Barger, uh, who, who asks, uh, does the U.S. take responsibility for the families in Afghanistan that have lost the main breadwinner? Is, is it done that way between, uh, it is done that way between tribes. If we don't, maybe it would be a way to develop a relationship with the elders. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of non-military uh, work that's being done there and maybe speak to that question? Um, sure. Well, it's an interesting question, Bob. And uh, First of all, you speak to a, a, a broader um, challenge in Afghanistan, which is uh, that th this is a country that has been plagued by war, um, not just for several years, but for decades. Um, and that has left um, severe losses within families and communities. Uh, there's literally been a, a, a near constant state of conflict um, with brief interruptions uh, since the Soviet invasion. Um, so this is a very war-torn society um, that has a lot of work to do. Uh, to get back on its feet. Of course, we have a, a military uh, strategy in place that the President put in place uh, to achieve our principal goal of denying Al-Qaeda an ability to uh, recreate the safe haven uh, in Afghanistan that they had before September 11th, uh, to break the momentum of the Taliban and prevent their takeover of the government, uh, again, which would take Afghanistan back to the kind of dangerous situation that we uh, faced before September 11th. Um, 
to do that, we are uh, building up Afghanistan's security forces.